of all shapes and sizes, colors and creeds, religions and non-religions, convictions and beliefs, genders and sexualities. This is the Love People Use Things podcast. This is the show all about pornography and its potential consequences on its users, on those in relationships, and on society and our culture at large. My name is Noah Church. I co-host this podcast with my friend Matt Frad, who is a ardent Christian, a Catholic to be more specific, and I myself am non-religious. So obviously we come from very different backgrounds, have different beliefs about a lot of things, but we agree that this is a conversation that needs to be had. We need to be talking about pornography, given that it's so pervasive in our society, in this developed world where we have immediate access to an unlimited amount of it, just at the click of a mouse and the stroke of a keyboard. And from a very young age, if we don't protect our children from it and educate them about its consequences. Today, we have a special episode for you. I know I say that like every time, they're all special episodes, but this one is more special because it's not just me talking today. I have an esteemed guest named Matt Dobschutz on the podcast today. Some of you may have heard of him or heard his podcast called Porn Free Radio. In the similar vein as what Matt and myself do, he's been doing it for far longer. He is also a recovery coach like myself, started in the same year in 2015. So you're about to hear an interview between myself and him. It's rather lengthy. We get in depth on a lot of good topics, our personal stories, uh, what helped us become free from pornography, and also what we tend to see in our clients, what traits and attributes are most, most correlated with success and the tools that we try to share with those clients to help them reach their goals. So buckle up, get ready for a journey, and be sure to check out Matt's platform at recoveredman.com, where you will find all of his podcast episodes and ways to work with Matt himself. All right, I think that's a long enough introduction. Let's get into the meat of the episode. Okay, we're recording in both places. We are live, but not really because we're Hello. just recording this to be released later. This podcast is recorded live <laughs> in Chicago, Illinois, and where, where, where are you? <laughs> Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. So perfect. Welcome everybody to Coach's Corner, the name that Matt Dobshoots <laughs> just came up with for this uh, little podcast we have going on here. You've... Well, the- You've already heard our separate introductions, whether you're listening to this on Porn Free Radio or on Love People Use Things, which we have not recorded yet, but due to the magic of editing, you already heard it. You're, you're already bringing them in to, and showing them where the sausage is made by talking about editing. <laughs> um, I realize no, no podcast listener cares about editing. The only people who oh, care yeah. about editing are you and me. <laughs> 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 but hey, man, it's great to actually meet you. Um, we just connected a couple weeks ago for the first time ever, Mm -hmm. even though for about three or four years, I've heard about you, seen videos of you, uh, had people, uh, on Reddit tell me about you. And so it's great to actually put a voice and a face with, uh, with Noah B church with the reputation. Yeah. I mean, your reputation really preceded you. I've heard several of your episodes of Porn Free Radio as well, as far back as probably a couple of years ago. And I'm really glad that you reached out to me and had this idea because I think it's great to connect and share you know, each other's resources with the other's audience. And I'm excited to see what you can bring and what wisdom you can share with, with our audience. Well, I was excited about Love People Use Things when it launched. I mean, I was interested in where Matt was going to go when he launched it, Matt Farad. And... Um, but I was I was pleasantly surprised when I heard your voice one day, uh, and then you guys have kind of created this this content schedule where Matt does an episode and then you do an episode, and you you've become partners. Like I've your name's on the podcast now, and uh, I thought this was great when I heard this, and uh, that's actually what made me reach out when I saw what you guys were doing together, and selfishly I wanted to kind of 
throw my voice into the mix. <laughs> so I'm so happy to be here. I love people use things. And I know we're going to release this on Porn Free Radio too, but but um, it's just cool what you guys are doing. And why don't, I mean, just for my audience, I know mm-hmm. you guys, everyone listening on Love People Use Things knows this, but how did you and Matt Frad um, get together just, and how did this partnership come come about? Well, the first time we met was at the Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation 2016. And that's a meeting that happens every 18 months about. And it's run by NICOSI, which is the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. And it's just a very, very inspiring conference. Lots of really powerful speakers and really passionate people who care about uh, protecting people and educating people about the dangers of pornography and prostitution, sexual trafficking. And so Matt was a keynote speaker there, and I also spoke at that conference about the neurobiology of pornography addiction. And so we just started talking with each other. We met in the bar, I think, after one of the days and started having a beer together and became friends after that. And I knew that he had been running Love People Use Things for a while, and he reached out to me and gave me this pitch. Yeah, I would like to sort of bring on a partner, someone with a different perspective, because he is, of course, a Catholic apologist, and I am not religious, very not religious. So we come at it from different backgrounds, but I think that that brings a lot to the show because it's not so secular. It's not just an echo chamber. Um, And yet we both agree on a lot of aspects of the harms of pornography, which is the crux of the show, of course. Yeah, I mean, and I'm... I'm right in there. I'm a, I'm I'm a Protestant Christian, so I'm a little mm-hmm. different flavor Christian. But the <laughs> um, but the essentials of what brings us together, I think, what you know, uh, with my show, with your show, is um, is not only the harm of pornography, but mm-hmm. just what it means to walk out in recovery and and grow and heal and and eliminate porn from your lives. I mean, I, I know that you talk about being porn free, and of course, that's a big. Uh, thing for me is this idea of moving to a life that's porn free and eliminating porn and porn behaviors and some of the little things we do that still sort of mimic or mirror, um, you know, the old porn addiction that we, we let go of. So, yeah. uh, Yeah. So I think it's cool. And, um, uh, and Matt can't be with us today because he's on on the internet fast. I heard the episode uh, <laughs> a week or two ago where the whole month of August he's like not no internet, right? That's right. Whole month of August. He's got like a burner phone, and only his <laughs> wife has the number. And uh, he's I I picture him like on a cliff, um, reading like some desert fathers, uh, you know. Rereading some Aquinas, perhaps. Yeah, Aqu- Aquinas or some, yeah, some some spiritual giant uh, and um, <laughs> just, I don't know. I think so. it's going to be a lot of family time too, which sounds like a real blessing that he's able to do that. And he's been working hard this month trying to pre-record and get everything together so that he doesn't have to have a direct presence in August. So he definitely deserves it. I'm eager to hear about how it goes for him. I think he'll have some insights to share when he gets back. Have you ever done anything like that where you just cut yourself off completely from either electronic entertainment or the internet itself? Writer's retreat uh, last uh, year, and um, it wasn't by choice, but mm-hmm. the camp that we were at, this like it was out in the middle of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, I had no cell coverage at all and uh, could, could barely get on the internet, so I just wrote and read and uh, I did drive into town at one point because I had to upload something, um, <laughs> and there was a vodka distillery in town, and that's why I sat there and uploaded. And they had Wi-Fi. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, they had Wi-Fi. So <laughs> that's what that's how I. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of funny because I'm at this uh, church camp, and then I went to the vodka distillery <laughs> to upload porn for radio. <laughs> so Good it story. worked out. Yeah. Well, uh, we just wanted to ask each other some questions. We had some prepared and just have a natural conversation, see what we can learn from each other. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll start since I introduced that. One question I had for you, and since we're both recovery coaches, we both work with clients individually and you do group coaching as well, which I think is a really cool idea and has a lot of value for people so they can have that miniature community where they can share themselves and feel support, not just from one person, a coach, but from people who are going through that journey at the same time. But uh, one question I had was, 
what are some of the most difficult types of clients that you encounter and what are some of the tools that you might use to help them break new ground? Well, for me personally, the client that I worry the most about is the client who has no connection with anyone else in his life Mm -hmm. related to recovery or his struggle. Um, Specifically, I work with a lot of married clients and it concerns me when the wife has no idea of the hidden world. Um, that, right. And, and I'm the first person that he's talking to. I'm, I'm, in some ways, I feel honored that he's sharing his story with me, but I'm worried about the uphill battle of how do you start to be more transparent in your life? How do you create a, a habit of honesty? How do you how do you let people see the the wounds and the needs that porn is covering over? You know when you you know when we get below porn and porn behaviors, you know there's always something underneath. You know, and, right. and um, if you're hiding, um, if a guy's hiding, um, it means they're hiding. A whole bunch of their their life, not just they're hiding their the addiction or the behaviors. They're hiding, um, you know, wounds, pain, needs, and if those things don't have a place to come out, it becomes dangerous for a coach, I think, or a therapist, or any sort of helping professional. When someone starts dealing with pain and doesn't have a good place to release it, mm-hmm. then they're in danger of maybe doing something harmful. Would you say that being open about all that with at least one person in their lives is necessary for recovery? You know, I don't know if we agree on this, but I, I, I think it's necessary to be integrated as a person, um, at some point. And, and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a quote uh, that I quoted on the podcast a few weeks ago and I don't have it in front of me, but you know, uh, Brene Brown has this quote that says that, you know, sometimes we think, that we need to to hide our uncomfortable stories or disown our hard stories in order to be to appear more whole but right. the truth is we have to embrace those things to to really find wholeness and so so yeah like i don't necessarily recommend that you walk into work and say, guess what guys, I'm a porn (laughs) addict, you know, I'm just being real, keeping it honest. Uh, but I also think that, yeah, you need some safe people in your life. You can be a little deeper and, and, and say, Hey, uh, I've struggled with porn and I don't have shame about it. Um, I'm not going to beat myself up and take on guilt and all this other stuff. Um, but I'm also not going to cover over some of the, the wounds and needs and help and, and the place where I need help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think we disagree about that. I always advise that people try to find at least one person in their lives that they feel safe opening up to about all these pains that they have inside. And often people have this fear, this really powerful fear about rejection if they show that part of themselves to others. And just opening up that first time to someone who actually knows them outside of like a coaching client relationship and seeing that they're still loved and still accepted can be such a cathartic and healing experience. And it's, it would be a shame to miss out on that experience. What, what was that like for you? Who, who was kind of the first person that you just sort of opened up to? Uh, The first one was my fledgling girlfriend at the time when I first started recovering and realizing that pornography was inimical to my sexual health as well as probably an addiction, though I wasn't entirely sure about that at the time. Do you remember the conversation? Yeah, I remember it very well. <laughs> where, where were you? Like, how did, how did it come up? Uh, I brought it up. We were on a run. We went to, in a, on a run to the park. And as we were running, I think after we took a little break and we we're having a breather. I just told her that, you know, I'm going through a strange time in my life right now and I'd like to share that. And I think I prefaced it with the question, like, well, you probably know that most guys, especially young guys, use pornography, right? Or look at pornography. And she said, yeah. And so that was a good jumping off point. I said that, well, you know, I grew up with that as an influence in my life as well. And it became something that was had a more powerful and more negative influence on me than I ever realized until just recently. And so I decided to quit after 
seeing you know this video, the Great Porn Experiment TED Talk by Gary Wilson, and I shared that with her later. And I also told her about other men whose stories I had read who'd gone through very similar things to me. And I told her about PIED and how I had never really been able to have a full and healthy, intimate connection physically or emotionally with a partner. And that I wanted hey, that, hey, and that's what I was working toward. But it might be some time before that was possible for me. I don't think I've ever explained what PIED is on Porn Free Radio. Do you want to? Oh, really? A, yeah, you want to give like a 30 well, Like 200 episodes, you never mentioned PIED? I might have mentioned it once, but I, I, don't, think <laughs> I, I don't usually use it by the acronym if, oh, if, okay. if I did. Uh, porn-induced erectile dysfunction. And the mechanisms of how it works and how it develops can take a whole episode. We could get into that. But the basics are you use pornography consistently over years. That's a level of sexual stimulation that is more powerful and more concentrated than our brains and those sexual response systems evolved to handle. And so we build a tolerance to it in order to protect ourselves from overstimulation. We, we numb ourselves. Uh, unconsciously on a biological and neurological level and so that we need more potent or more specific types of sexual stimulation to allow us to become physically aroused and it can get to the point after years of use where a real person right in front of you who is attractive and wants to sleep with you is not enough to breach that barrier and get you physically aroused and that's porn induced erectile dysfunction. Oh, a great definition. So it's, it, I mean, it's just basically like you're having trouble maintaining erections with the partner. And, yeah. And it's probably to because use. you've been teasing uh, and doing these binge sessions where you're just, you know, clicking on one thing after another, kind of keeping yourself in a state of constant mm -hmm. arousal by, by variety, multiple types of images. And yeah. And then when you, when you unplug and you are with a real person, your brain's like, hey, where's all the stimulus that mm -hmm. I'm used to? And it can develop with guys who have a lot of sexual experience. And it usually happens after a breakup or a divorce where they get more into pornography for a time before starting to re-enter the dating pool. And then they find, well, it, something's wrong. Something's not working right down there. Or, or it can develop um, more severely often with guys who have no sexual experience. And that was, that was me because I developed it by the time I was a young teenager. And the first time I tried to have sex, I already had severe PIED. <laughs> wow. I did, I did not know that, but that mm -hmm. makes total sense. I mean, if you've been engaging with a certain type of sexual stimulus for yeah, however long. Yeah. It's not just about, um, the power of the stimulus and being numb or desensitized or not. It's also about being conditioned to certain sexual stimuli or cues yeah. for arousal. Right. And when you're a heavy user of porn, especially one who has little to no sexual experience, those cues are things like being alone in front of a computer screen, opening up a private browser window, uh, typing into the search bar. And none of that is present when you're actually with a real person. And so it I can even, feel like an alien experience when that happens. And none of those cues are yet tied or conditioned to your sexual arousal. And so that's the rewire part of recovery in which you relearn or learn for the first time on a subconscious and instinctual level to be aroused just by being close to someone that you're attracted to. I'll, I'll, I'll even give you something interesting in terms of my recovery. Yeah. I, um, you know, I was addicted to porn before the internet. And so, but there were a whole bunch of rituals tied with acting out. Um, for example, walking to the video store, mm -hmm. um, going and picking out the videos, getting the videos from the guy, walking back with the bag, all those things. Like there was arousal, there was dopamine because there was the anticipation. Um, yeah. And yeah, when you're connecting with your, uh, you know, I was, I, uh, got married, you know, a few years after this, vi the video store stuff. Yeah. When you, when you're married, yeah, there, that, those kind of arousal cues, that sort of ritual, none of that's there hmm. when you're in the dark, having intimate relations with your, your partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of those like weird sort of rewired things that, that I became, that I associated with orgasm. Yeah. It's like, there. 
it's like you've been playing basketball your whole life and then you're thrown into a soccer match when you've never heard of soccer before and you're trying to dribble the ball and everyone's shouting at you and nothing's working right, you're getting red cards called on you. It's, uh, it's just an alien, different experience and you have to relearn to relate to sexually on an intimate level with somebody else. Yeah, I was listening uh Dr. Majors at uh this guy at Harvard um in one of the talks I saw him do or or read that he a uh, transcript of the talk he he equated it to like playing like video games versus playing chess. It's like there's plenty of drama and excitement in chess and <laughs> and, and and it totally engages your brain. But if you're used to just playing video games, it's like a completely different skill set and and you know, it, it's a different way it works. So, it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And the problem too is that even like chess and video games, they're mostly you know on a conscious level, whereas that physical arousal response is completely out of your conscious control. Right. And so that's that's why it's not just it's not just a psychological problem; it's a neurological problem, really. And it can take a lot of time for that to heal. Hey, I got a question for you. So, um. So you you entered this by watching the video, like Dr. Or Gary Wilson's video and TED mm -hmm. Talk, and and you got inspired and stuff. What were some of those early things in recovery that helped you kind of shift into like having longer form of sobriety, regaining arousal, some of that stuff? What were some of those early habits that you picked up that really helped? Well, the very first thing I did after deciding, okay, this is me, this is what I have to do, I have to leave porn behind forever, was I basically sat down for three days and just wrote. And I wrote out my entire like, sexual history, everything I'd ever felt about it, every experience I'd ever had, and also my vision and goals for the future. And that really helped me ground myself and understand myself and how I'd gotten to the point where I was at now and have a real clear hope and vision for the future. And then... I ended up sharing that on a porn recovery forum called Your Brain Rebalanced, where people can post journals and chronicles of their recoveries and comment on each other's progress and answer each other's questions. And that felt good to share that with, with others who were going through similar struggles, and they really appreciated that story as well. So we were feeding off of each other's energy. And that is what eventually turned into my book, because I just didn't want to stop writing as I was going through this journey because it was such a transformative and powerful experience for me. And really, no book existed out there that could provide answers or a framework to guide people into this same journey and answer questions about what could be wrong with them if they're experiencing sexual dysfunction. Because when I had first searched for answers back in 2008, I found nothing about PIED. I don't, I'm not sure... The phrase even existed. It might have, but it was not prevalent on the internet at that time. And so that was very helpful for me is to be part of that community and also get my feelings out in a concrete way on paper. Another thing I did that helped me was I was starting that new relationship and I was open and honest with her. And we, we formed an emotional intimacy that I hadn't really felt before, even though I'd had girlfriends before. I, now that porn was out of my life, I felt unhindered and able to fully open up and form those intimate connections in a way that I don't think was possible for me when I was using pornography. And I started to tell other people too, my close friends and eventually my parents, and it felt good to unburden myself that way. I tried to develop positive habits that I would do on a daily basis that I knew was were going to help me grow and focus more on what I was trying to build and less on what I was missing, quote unquote, in pornography. And I knew that, I think on an instinctual level, that it wasn't just as simple as quitting porn. It was also adding in things that would fulfill those needs that I was trying to satisfy with pornography in a more meaningful and long lasting and satisfying way. Um, so that, all that helped me in the beginning. But sounds like sounds like a lot of like sort of massive change all at once. Like yeah, to be yeah. honest, like a lot of people describe their first few weeks as grueling and difficult and uh, fraught with urges and temptations. But the first few months for me were mostly temptation free because I had struggled so long, unknowing 
about with this problem that this lack of ability to have sex and have a satisfying relationship that there was a lot of pain there and pain is a good motivator at least for a while and so i was i was sure i was leaving this behind forever and there was no room in my mind for allowing the possibility of using pornography it just wasn't an option for me at that time i i had a similar experience um when um when I started, I mean, my real recovery, I mean, I, I tried as a younger single guy to, um, to try to get help here or there, but it wasn't until a couple years in marriage when my wife caught me downloading pornography on our home computer that kind of my secret and, and just some of the things I'd been hiding all came out in one dramatic night. <laughs> and, um, and it was like probably the one of the hardest things that ever happened to me, but I even remember in the moment standing by the bed, kind of apologizing, trying to explain myself, um, going, Hey, everything now is going to be different because Mm -hmm. my, uh, my wife knows and there's, I've always not, I've I've never wanted this in my life. And so now this sort of exposure is going to, result in something being different like everything after this moment there's before this moment and after and uh, i started taking action Uh, shortly after that i went to a recovery group and and um it was i still was tempted there were definitely i mean i was tempted to lie i was still Mm -hmm. i had to do all these things in my my environment to keep myself safe but it definitely did change the conversation and, and start to expose. And I remember already feeling freer uh, and unburdened by just yeah. having someone else know. Um, and then even after some, some relapses, I remember it, it just taking to me to a deeper level of honesty and, mm-hmm. and even admitting failure, admitting, uh, that I still have weakness, that I still need people, that I still need tools. Mm-hmm. Um, all those things really helped um, grow, you know, grow, help me grow in recovery. So here's a two part question for you. Uh, when you did relapse, would you always tell your wife about it? And do you recommend that your clients do the same? Yeah. When, we started with what I would consider a disclosure in, in the sense of like, we had some good conversations the first week of my, uh, of her finding out about everything that I had done in the past and mm-hmm. things I had looked at, ways that I had acted out, things I lied about. So we kind of had a pretty clean slate when I started recovery. There weren't a whole bunch of deep, dark secrets that I hadn't shared. So from that point on, we made it a policy to, I made it a policy to, to be honest about stuff. And, um, and while I wasn't always quick to be honest about a relapse, mm-hmm. uh, eventually creating that habit of honesty, uh, led me to, to at some point explain what happened or, or confess what happened to her. So I, I, we kind of created that open line of communication where, you know, she, she wanted to know if I, had a relapse and, and I still needed to be connected and honest with her. It was important for me to not go back to that, um, that part of me that was hiding, uh, in the, the addiction. So the way I describe it is as I started, um, sharing what was going on in the inside with me, uh, I felt like I was, you know, I'd been living a divided life when I was in the addiction and I felt like I came, sort of together, like the inside and outside matched. And if I relapsed, what would happen is it would feel like I'd start disintegrating again and breaking apart into the hidden life and the, in the life I showed people. That's a good way to describe it. And the thing is, here's the interesting thing. At some point, the cost and the, how painful that was to feel that disintegration was worse than the pain of actually being honest and telling her about what happened. That, that's when recovery flipped for me. Um, I started being honest with the people in my life because I didn't like that feeling. It felt unsafe to be hiding and lying again. Um, whereas 
the safety fault uh, came out in the honesty and being known. Um, and it wasn't just my wife. I had some other people in my life that I had made a commitment to to tell and had a part of my recovery to to sort of involve. So if I had a relapse, it wasn't just my wife. It was a number of people that I would go to and be honest with and get help from. Mm -hmm. And did your conversations with your wife, were they healing for both of you when you were honest about relapse? They were. Um, One of the most powerful ones was I had a relapse after a couple of years and um, you know, my wife took it hard and, and she was crying and she was upset by it. Uh, and immediately I felt this thing rise up in me and I started uh, crying and I kind of curled up in a ball and I started saying, you know, why do you love me? Hmm. You know, and, and she actually, it was so dramatic for her to see me react this way that she actually was worried about me. She thought something was wrong and um, she's a Christian and she started praying for me right there. You know, we, in my church, we have a, we have kind of a, um, a tradition of actually praying, like, you know, putting hands on and praying. So she was, mm-hmm. she was worried that something really was breaking in me or something was, you know, wrong with me emotionally. And, um, and, uh, but what I realized as she was sort of, I could hear her sort of praying quietly for me and I'm crying I realized I had this mistaken belief that I was unlovable. Mm -hmm. And so what I realized was this whole pattern of relapse and even having to explain myself or confess was actually triggering shame in me. Like, Mm. and it, it sort of felt like it was make, it felt true. Like I am unlovable. Um, and I realized that was a lie that, that, that was like self rejection that I was embracing. Um, so one of the most healing moments of my entire life came after a relapse. That's powerful. Um, And, and it, and what cool, you know, I know you guys are love people use things. I mean, what really motivated me in recovery was love. You know, like I felt unlovable at this core place underneath all the porn and the porn behaviors and the lying, the hiding. And so what being honest about my struggle allowed to have happen is that lie that where I felt unlovable and not good enough was able to come to the surface. And my wife is actually a very loving person. She's a great person, um, to, to know that you're loved by, you know, and, (laughs) um, and other people too. There are other people in my life who are ready to step up and really love me in hard places. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and by being honest, I was, it, it opened that up. And do you, because I hear some people recommend that you not use your wife or partner as an accountability partner and that you shouldn't always tell her, at least if there's a lot of betrayal trauma there. What do you think about that? And do you always recommend that your clients open up to their partners about relapse? I think it's a case-by-case basis. I think I think people are best served if they're staying honest about relapses and unsound activity in their life. Um, but when you're recovering from betrayal trauma, you know, there might be other things you need to do for your wife to make her feel safe. And, uh, I think my wife feels pretty safe and work through her stuff. Um, but she's not my primary, uh, accountability partner either. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I use my accountability partner for now, or people in my accountability would be to, anticipate threats or help me navigate situations where I need help. Hmm. I was just on a business trip this last week uh, to podcast movement. And uh, I was checking in with a friend through text while I was there, just anticipating threats. Now I called my wife every night, but we're not talking about, Oh, I saw saw right. an attractive woman walk by and I was drawn <laughs> to her. That's, I'm processing that with my my accountability partner mm-hmm. and, uh, or the person I was texting for the trip. And, um, you know, so I think there's, but there's places where I've talked to my wife, um, recently about something that kind of caught my attention or maybe something that was kind of, obs- I was thinking about obsessively. Um, so I use, I definitely, you know, communicate and talk about things that are coming up for me. Mm-hmm. Now, among your clients, would you say that, all of them or the majority of them are addicts because a good portion of mine 
aren't actually what I would call addicts. They have developed porn-induced sexual dysfunctions or other porn-related problems in their lives, but once they realize that it is porn that is the cause, they're able to give it up and never go back without too much difficulty. Is that the same with your clients? Well, I I never refer to my clients as addicts, and mm-hmm. I, I rarely ever would say to on Porn Free Radio, addicts this, addicts that. Okay. I, I, um, but I have used the word addiction, and I remember even early on in my recovery, and this is in the early 2000s with my wife, I used to refer to like being in the addiction or my addictions kind of telling me this because mm-hmm. it did feel like there was this piece that um, went to this other level uh, of, of obsessive thinking and compulsive behavior. Um, so I, I did define it as addiction for me, um, but I don't think I ever called myself an addict um, or very Where, rarely. Would why is there a line there between having an addiction and being an addict? Is it just because you don't want to label yourself that way? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you know, um, I feel like an addict and a lot of things we would call ourselves are a secondary identity. You know, I mean, for me as a Christian, I identify as a Christian first and yeah. that's where I find my identity. So, and other people might identify themselves a different way, but I think addict is kind of a, you know, there's a lot of negativity around the word. A, yeah. I and I don't, understand. I don't really like using the word, but so, but what I'd say for my clients is I do see people who really have more of the signs of, of a really hardcore addiction in terms of um, an, just more like an extreme version of a habit where, mm-hmm. where this has become the normal. Feelings come up, go to porn. Um, negative, negative situations happen, porn. Uh, mm-hmm. positive situations happen, porn, <laughs> right? So it's like, I definitely see people who are in addiction, you know, they're just like, they're, they're reacting to life and their, their main coping mechanism is porn. Yeah. Um, well now, As we do could, I, certainly. yeah. And we might, we might have a, uh, I sometimes wonder whether I'm working with people nowadays who, because of the proximity of internet porn, if, if in the old days they would be addicted to porn, mm-hmm. um, like, cause I was addicted to porn back when I had to go get the magazines or buy a video or that type of stuff. And I don't know if everyone else would be walking to the video store in, you know, snow, like I used to in Chicago. I don't know if every, everyone else is like that. I would say a lot of people who maybe struggle with porn nowadays probably would have been compulsive masturbators in the old days. Mm -hmm. Um, They'd be just using a lot of fantasy and a lot of sort of um, masturbation compulsively to to deal with feelings. And there are um, certainly people who can develop problems and compulsivity just with masturbation alone. Sure. I think the majority of people who do develop a pornography addiction, especially in the internet age would not have reached at least those levels nearly a significant negative impact on their lives without internet pornography, just because it's so readily available, easily accessible and with an unlimited variety of content. And it's, it's endlessly novel, endlessly attractive. Whereas masturbation, you might do it once or twice in a day and it gets boring and you move on with your life, but there's always more porn to see. Right. Yeah. No, I definitely agree with that. Uh, um, um, I, I, the novelty and, you know, the continual sort of, and even the way, even the way websites are set up, um, mm-hmm. uh, I, I did an, uh, a podcast a long time ago about how, you know, the goal as a web developer and a, and a, and a, and a, and a person who builds websites is to make money. And the way you make money is to keep people on your site. And the way you keep people on your site is by creating sticky content. That's what we used to call it mm-hmm. in marketing. And it's basically content that you keep clicking on and reading and, you know, that continually interests you. Um, so when someone got to the end of a blog post of the corporate company I worked for, you know, we tried to suggest another blog post because ideally we want them to mm-hmm. read that next blog post. And, you know, porn is is just an extreme version of that. It's like it's <laughs> yeah. always true. I mean, pornographers are trying to make money too. And, and 
they do that by creating content that we want to click on. Mm -hmm. So what are a few qualities that you can see in a new client and think to yourself, this guy is going to be successful? Well, the favorite thing I see, and you've probably seen this too, is just uh, taking the time to apply or uh, filling out the application or getting on a call with me has already created momentum. Mm-hmm. You know, they like, for example, I, I, it's, it's not uncommon for me to get on the phone with someone and they applied seven days ago and they've been porn free all seven days, almost in anticipation of the call. Right. Um, and, and I, a, a friend of mine uh, told me this, that it's called the flight into health. Uh, that that's where like all the, um, the emotional and psychic energy that it takes, I don't know if psychic is the right word, but <laughs> the brain energy that it takes to make a choice to choose a healthy thing actually creates momentum. Um, so that is always a good sign when someone comes in on a roll. Um, cause that means that they really want it and they're making that change in their head right. prior to, um, I think humility is good. Um, because this is such a, one of the big things with this addiction is, um, you know, struggling with honesty and struggling with really, you know, asking for help. And so I think a level of humility really helps. Um, so some willingness, some humility, um, those are a couple of things I look for. Um, yeah, you have to have some humility to be coachable because if yeah. you think you know everything already, you're not going to absorb any new skills. I ask a question too, who knows about this in your life? So mm-hmm. if it's, if it's nobody again, that's, that's a red flag for me. Um, but, but I also know too, that it takes some time that sometimes I'm the first person they're reaching out to. So one of the initial things that we might work on is who else can you bring into your circle? You know, one of the main things that I like working on guys with is when we create our plan, you know, who's someone you can share this with? Who's a safe person? They might not be your accountability partner uh, or someone who's going to, who you're going to like talk to on a daily basis about this, but who's someone that you can share a little of this part of your world with just so you start to feel more known. Mm -hmm. How about you? What do you look for? I look for, well, I look for people who, number one, show determination. If they are struggling with relapse, if they're caught in a cycle, that's that's all fine. That's someone I'm absolutely willing to work with. But if I see that that person has continually tried new things, experimented, told somebody in their life, you know, tried to reach out, and, you know, taking that step to look for coaching is another link in that chain along the road to recovery. So just that, like you said, shows me that they're willing to take new action and break out of the circle of relapse. But when someone comes to me and they say, this is what I want, and they have a clear vision for their future, I haven't been able to get there yet, but with your help, I hope to be there and they have questions for me, they have hopes for the future that are specific and attainable, then that's someone I know they have the raw determination that we can mold together into a form that will allow them to get into their destination. And often they're just lacking the skills or the tactics or the knowledge that will help them get there. But if they have the drive, that's really all that's necessary at the beginning. I'll give you. Uh, I'll give you one that's that's that uh, that's our coaching corner answer. The faster someone uh, sets up payment for coaching, <laughs> that's a good indication. Mm-hmm. Um, when I when I send an email, you know, after we have our coaching call, I say, "Here's the next step. Here's I'll send you a link to set up payment, wh- whatever package we've agreed on, or whatever meeting type of thing, or if they're joining." Uh, my rev groups, you know, here's the link to to set up your subscription. And they follow through right away. If they follow through in the first like 20 minutes after that email lands, mm-hmm. I'm like, there's, there's momentum here. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I, there was one guy I remember who 
followed through like two months later. And I was, and, and I actually would have appreciated him ca- calling me before <laughs> right. clicking yes to that. Um, cause it did make me nervous. Cause I was like, what happened? What, mm-hmm. what, what was going on in his head that, you know, caused this, this level of delay. And are we going to face that when we start coaching? Like, are we going to all of a sudden have a moment where he checks out for two months <laughs> or doesn't click in, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's one that's kind of random. Um, uh, the faster someone takes action, uh, the better the better off I think that, that they're going to be in terms of getting that that momentum to make a real change. Mm-hmm. Also, I, I look qu- for for greater focus on what they can do, like what personal actions can they take. They want they're just ready. They're hungry for right. the ability to take control of their lives back and take their power back. And whereas, whereas other people, that hunger isn't quite there yet. And that's something that we have to foster together. Sometimes they ask me a question like, you know, what would you do about this situation? And, and I'll try to do the coaching answer and say, listen, I'll tell you what I would do. But just give me a couple of ideas maybe you've had about this. Mm-hmm. And the, and the guy who's been thinking about it, he usually has like two or three things that he could do. And sometimes one of those things is the thing he should do. <laughs> Whatever my idea was is right. not anywhere near as good as what he came up with. A lot um, of times people have a lot of the knowledge already, but they don't believe in it yet because yeah. it's just ideas in their brain. And they know that some of the ideas in their brain are worthwhile and some are worthless and they have trouble parsing out which ones to invest in. And they need, need, need that idea bounced back off of a coach or an accountability partner in order for it to feel valid. What's a tool that you use with uh, some of your coaching clients? What's something that you either teach them or something that you walk them through? Well, I have a bunch. Uh, One that I use pretty commonly is to have a journal that they keep with them at all times to record whenever they have an urge, even if it's mm. a small one or a temptation. And they just you know write down the day and the time, write a couple sentences about how they're feeling right now. Maybe if they uh, want to get into it, what led up to this, what could be causing this urge, I encourage them to think about that acronym HALT, which is hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, which just refers to a lot of the urges and temptations that we have arise out of these little That's uh, me like every day now. <laughs> <laughs> You're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired all the, all day, every day? Pretty much. Well, I mean, I'm hung. I'm, <laughs> let's see. I'm not angry right now. So yeah. I'm just, I'm hungry, a little lonely, although we're connecting. So, mm-hmm. so I, okay, I'm just, I'm just H and T right now. Hungry and tired. All yeah. Right. Well, if you're aware of those things, then you can, before acting on an urge, try to address those. So, okay, instead of going to my phone and searching for an erotic image, I'm going to make a sandwich first. That, that, I don't have to think about anything else. I'm just going to make a sandwich. And so having that ability to put their thoughts and their feelings down on paper and making that a consistent habit where that's the first thing they think to do when they have an urge helps to rise themselves, raise themselves outside of that impulsive loop where they're just following the urge and allowing themselves to sink back into that pathway that's so well grooved into their brains and come back into that part of themselves that is rational and knows what's actually good for them and is capable of planning and foreseeing consequences. And once they have developed that habit of just recording the urges, and it can be very educational for them as well because they start to realize, oh, I have a lot of my urges looking back in the evening after I'm tired from work and I'm just watching TV or watching YouTube clips. So maybe I need to do something about that. But how that tool evolves is that after they have that habit, I get them to commit in that moment not to not use porn forever because that can be a difficult decision to make when you're right. flooded with dopamine and in the midst of that urge, but just to not use pornography or not make that decision until they've written, say, three pages if it's a like, small pocket journal. And so they don't have to tell themselves, I'm not going to use porn forever or not even, I'm not going to use porn today. It's just I'm not going to use until I write three pages. And often the process of writing those three pages is enough 
to get them past the the wave of that urge and rise back into knowing what's good for them and also write down a commitment to do something else. Like, okay, well, instead, I'm going to go make a sandwich or I'm going to go for a run or take a cold shower, whatever it may be. I like that. I, I like that because it's not just a disruptive habit, like a disruption, like uh, I'll take a cold shower when I feel this feeling. It's mm-hmm. it's actually reflective. It, it involves engaging another part of your brain, mm-hmm. um, maybe the higher functioning part of your brain. Uh, I just think there's a lot of cool things with that. And I like the idea of the habit of, hey, when I have a feeling or an urge, I don't have to act on it. There's actually space to maybe reflect. Um, you know, I, I talk, I say a quote on the podcast all the time that I stole from Tony Robbins, winners anticipate, losers react. And it's like, mm. a lot of times when guys are first coming at this, their, their whole life is just reacting to porn stimulus, like have a thought, have an urge, act out. Right. And they almost think that there's no time in between the urge and, and, and what you realize in recovery, you can start to make time. You can lengthen the gap between those things. And, and believe it or not, there's opportunities in there to do something different. Um, so I, I love that one. That's reflective and disruptive at the same time. So, so it's not just, you know, not just the cold shower. Or yeah. It's not some, always realistic to take seven cold showers in a day. Right. <laughs> no. And I like the idea of the habit of, of even tracking your feelings and 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 mm-hmm. getting a, a clearer picture of hey what are you what's actually what are the urges that are capturing you or what are the things that are coming up for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, with great. this, it's not just about distracting yourself or or staving off the urge. At the same time, like you said, you are reflecting and being mindful about what's going on and analyzing how you're feeling and trying to understand where it's coming from. And even if that doesn't help you abstain from porn that day or in that moment, it's still going to be a learning experience that you can then draw from later and look back on and to help you understand what can I do differently in the future? How can this evolve? Maybe I need to change my environment. Maybe I I can't bring my smartphone into my room anymore because I have all these urges at night when I have my smartphone in my room. Or maybe something else has to change. But having that all out on paper allows them to analyze and plan and anticipate, as Tony Robbins says. One of the tools that that I use with my clients right at the beginning is helping them come up with a why for why they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And the way the formula that I use for it is to um, first say, tell me some of the things that pornography is costing you. And and I have to really dig because sometimes people are like, well, I don't spend money on porn. It's like <laughs> they only think about it in terms of money. Right. Um, but usually we dig down and we start to find, um, you know, they'll say something like, hey, well, it, it causes my wife's unhappy about it. But even that, I'll try to get it more internal. Like, so what is your wife unhappy? How does that cost you? Mm-hmm. Wow, there's disconnection. Well, what is it when you're when you're not in connection with your wife? What? How do you feel? I feel lonely. You know, I don't feel loved. Or so it's like that's. It's not that the wife's unhappy. It's unhappiness with wife means a lack of connection, which means mm-hmm. you feel lonely. So, yeah. so starting to come up with what's the real cost? You know, someone said a lot of times guys will say, "Well, I spent a lot of time." Well, you know, you could be building a boat in your garage and spend a lot of time and you don't go to, you don't wake up the next morning and go, oh my God, I spent three hours on my boat building hobby. <laughs> you know, there's Filled something, why, yeah. why, why does porn, why is porn time different? Oh, porn, um, you didn't plan on looking at porn. You had something meaningful that you needed to do and it hijacked you. And took you on a ride for three hours and then spit you out at the end and you felt crappy. Uh, you know, you didn't, you weren't happy with what you looked at. It basically, you know, hijacked you for three hours and you're, you're uncomfortable. Like it, it left you worse off. You know, you could, you could spend three hours in the garage and you feel recharged and you feel, you know, y- yeah, maybe it was, it was time well wasted. Uh, but and almo- you never, almost you usually don't have that with porn, right? 
And almost every time exactly what porn is costing us are the impetus for using porn. It's like if you have a lack of connection with your wife because she's unhappy because you're relapsing and using porn, that loneliness and disconnection is why you're seeking out satisfaction in porn. I I, I totally agree. You know, I mentioned before I've had this big lie that I felt unlovable. Well, I always used when I used porn, it was basically agreeing with the lie that I was unlovable. And I had to try to get affirmation from this naked woman who was doing something on, on screen that somehow made me feel lovable. Of course, when the video ended or the orgasm happened, I felt more unlovable than ever. Yeah. You know? So it's like, I, it was like the, it was like the definition of dysfunction. The thing I really wanted I, I would do the opposite of, you know, um, you know, I'd want love, but I would do something that totally agreed with the, the, the lie that I was unlovable. Um, so, so I kind of press in on the cost for the first part of the why, and then I try to help them see a benefit. Like, what are they actually moving towards? You know, who are they becoming? Mm-hmm. What do, what do they get? What do they actually get? What's that selfish thing they get? if porn is eliminated from their lives. And sometimes it takes a while, like, you know, like maybe they identified they're letting go of this loneliness and they're moving towards what connection, but you know, what, why is mm-hmm. connection important? Um, well, you know, I don't know, like it could be that they want to be a better dad or they, they want, um, they want to be the man. They want to, uh, I know one. They want to be the same on the inside as on the outside. The, the 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 guy they show people, the dad, the husband, the father, the leader that they show people is actually who they are on the inside. It's yeah. not, you know, so sometimes, so the why is usually you come up with a cost that you're sick and tired of and what you want more of in your life, a benefit. So you put it together and you say something like, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm committed to being porn free because I'm sick and tired of uh, living a lonely life or or li- being lonely, and I want more. I want people to see the real me. I want to be the same on the inside as on the outside. I want that connection. And if that's, you put that, that's really good. That's and where you, we all have to start. Is and the is more succinct you can get that, mm-hmm. moving away from this, moving towards this the clearer it is of why you do recovery and it's internal. It's not, it's not an external locus of control. It's not like, well, my wife would be happier if I do this. No, I have connection when I move into being porn free or, you know, I have more confidence, you know, it's like, there's a reason I'm doing this for me. And after they have that foundation, that why, and they might, you know, attain, greater streaks of sobriety than they have before, but they're still struggling with dealing with urges in the moment and remembering their why, what's a tool that you might share with them to help them in that moment? Well, once they have the why, then it's easier to build a recovery plan Mm -hmm. that where they really start to anticipate what are those threats in their life. So when do the urges come? What are the things that are capturing their attention? Uh, and then starting to anticipate those things and you find tools that will work with those. Um, so it could be an emotional trigger. Hey, when I feel stressed, I tend to act out. So what can you do with stress? What's a habit to relieve stress when you, when you're aware that you're stressed and you know, you and I were talking about becoming aware, like your journaling exercise, the guy's going to start to become more aware that he's feeling stressed. So it's starting to come up with what's the habit, what's the go-to habit for stress. Mm -hmm. And when you feel lonely, what's, what's your go-to habit for connection? Um, you know, what is the healthy go-to habit that will, yeah, the healthy go-to habit, the habit that actually meets the need. (laughs) Yes. Uh, I mean, you could feel lonely and go to porn, but it's, you're just going to feel more lonely at the end of it. (laughs) Oh, that's easy, Matt. My go-to habit is using porn. Right. Well, my go-to habit was using porn for everything. And so (laughs) uh, that wasn't working for me. Um, So, so yeah, it's like out of the why you can start to help, um, you know, zero in on what are the, what are the, what are the, uh, the emotional triggers, you know, what are some of the mistaken beliefs that maybe you have? And then what the easiest one to deal with is, is 
what are some like weak links in your life, you know, like just in your environment, you know, uh, I just did a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago called mindless recovery. Uh, and the idea was what are environmental changes that you can make that you're, you you do not even really notice, mm-hmm. but it eliminates access to something or it cuts something off. And I got it from this idea of, uh, mindless eating, uh, where they did all this research to find that, you know, the size plate you have at a buffet oh, yeah. dictates how much you eat. Um, or, you know, some of these little things like the way that you approach food is impacted by your environment. Yeah, or just and, what's what's available. If you have shelves filled with chips, then you're going to eat chips. If you have a lot of carrots and hummus available, then you'll eat those. Yeah, they, so said, can, they said people who had a visible... Uh, bowl of fruit in the, in the kitchen, um, ate more fruit and le- weighed less than people <laughs> who didn't have a bowl of fruit. So that's an example of like what, yeah. um, what are things in your environment that you can do to, to make yourself successful? Those are the easiest ones. And, and the funny thing is you talked about clients who are successful. The clients who are successful get, get all those things out of the way right away. And then we're just focused on some of those emotional things and the mistaken beliefs in their plan. The clients that aren't successful are the ones who are hanging on to um, whatever it is, YouTube, hanging on to some random thing that they keep getting stuck uh, mm-hmm. with and they're not willing to do what it really takes. You know, uh, And sometimes in 12-step groups, they'll say half measures availed us nothing. And so the client who keeps taking half measures never gets full, you know, never gets that freedom because they're right. always, they are always leaving themselves the option to, well, if I really feel stressed, then I can <laughs> hit the, hit the porn escape plan. Yeah. What's that saying? I'm going to, I'm going to use a bad word here, but the saying is a hundred percent is a breeze. 99% is a bitch <laughs> because as long as there's that little crack in your resolve or commitment or belief in the life that you know that you want, that crack can be exploited so easily by the part of you that is still compulsive and still relying on pornography for some sort of fulfillment that that part of you believes it will bring into your life. But 100%, if you're 100% committed to it, it's just not an option and you can allow yourself to feel free and feel the space around you and not feel like there's always something right behind you on, on your back, having to look over your shoulder and, and fear that in the wrong moment, it'll pounce. I got, I got a coach question for you. Shoot. How did you move from struggler who was in recovery, getting some tools to like the guy who puts himself out there on YouTube and says, come follow me guys. What, <laughs> wh- how did that come about? Well, it didn't start as, a coaching thing. I just wanted to put out the information that I had learned both in book form and in video. So I started making YouTube videos. And then later that year, that first year that I was into this, I got invited to do a live storytelling event. And that became one of my most popular YouTube videos where I just told my story of porn addiction and porn induced sexual dysfunction and recovery. And so during all this time, I was I was trying to help those I could who reached out to me. People would email me with their own stories and questions, and I would either answer them personally or make a video out of it, answering their question for every, everyone because so many of the problems are so common and interrelated to each other that answering one person's question online can answer 10,000 people's question who are very similar. And so it just sort of evolved naturally as time went on, and I got more and more emails and questions and and. Ask, ask people asking for help that I realized I could, I could do this in such a way that I could make it something I could put a lot of time into and, and help people in a way that can also help support myself so that I don't have to go out and work a lot of other jobs at the same time and have less time for helping those who are asking for it. And so I, I'd seen other coaches online in other aspects of life like business coaches and life coaches, dating coaches. And so I was aware of the model that was out there and I took that model and made it my own and had my first coaching call, I think in late 2015. So that was about two years after I started this journey myself. 
Wow, awesome. I mean, that's I think that's the same year I started, so oh, okay. Uh, that's I probably had my first coaching call in the summer of 2015, so mm-hmm. um that's cool. Yeah, and you do group coaching as well, right? Yeah, that that came about of, you know, I I noticed that a lot of clients um still had that lack of connection. Um they might have had one or two people, but even those people weren't as tied in with recovery. They weren't they were just people who cared about the client, but mm-hmm. they weren't they weren't someone who was necessarily available to take a text every day or to yeah. you know to you know have a phone call every day of a business trip and so um I put together my first coaching group and I think I think it was 2016 and um man right away um just seeing the guys connect with one another just took it to another level because they, mm-hmm. you know, there was, I was there, but they also had each other. So instead of having a one-on-one connection, they had a one to to six, one to seven connection. And, um, and just a lot of those offline connections, you know, they started contacting each other throughout the week. Mm-hmm. Um, the groups self-organized in the last couple of years to have WhatsApp groups and, uh, check in on our tribe and different tools. Um, so it's been cool to just see some of those connections and seeing guys even keep connection after they've left groups, you know, just. Right. It can help um, so help. much to have a pack around you yeah. all working toward the same goal. Yeah. Like one of, one of, of my former guests, Michael Leahy, he said he doesn't even like the, the phrase accountability partner, you know, putting all your accountability on one person, mm-hmm. Um, but he he loves the model of accountability group, the idea that, hey, there's a group of guys I'm accountable to, a group of guys I can press into, connect with. And, um, you know, and I mean, we say this all the time uh, on my podcast, and I'm sure you've heard the quote, you know, the opposite of it, addiction is connection. And, you know, why wouldn't you want some more connection? Like if you really, if that's really the goal to get out of the the hiddenness, the lying, the hiding, the dishonesty, the the loneliness, the crappy feelings, the morning after. If you really want to get rid of all that, why wouldn't you embrace more more active connection? Yeah, that desire to recover in isolation is definitely a red flag for me. And I'm I'm not going to say it's impossible. I've seen it happen, but it's a lot harder. It's a lot more difficult than if you have a group around you. Well, here's the thing, you know, when I, um, when I was in porn, when I was in the addiction, what did I do? I depended on myself. I kept things hidden. I, um, you know, acted out with porn. Mm -hmm. And if I take the same script in recovery and go, okay, well, I'm going to recover on my own. I'm going to keep things hidden. I'm going to. If you you want things you've never had, you have to do things you've never done. Yeah. So it's like, I I realized that, you know, um, uh, I mean, in, in, if Matt was here, I would, I'd, I'd appeal to this point, but you know, I see this sometimes with spiritual people or people or not spiritual people, like Christians in particular, they, they replace, um, an addiction with like, like sort of self-reliant legalism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, I'll just make myself stronger and just kind of white knuckle (laughs) through this. And and they're still relying on themselves. They're not using community. They're not even using God. They're still trying to do it on their own. It's like they're doing the exact same thing. It's just as bad as the addiction, (laughs) you know, so... Well, I think we're starting to test everyone's patience. I believe we're coming up on an hour on the podcast, so we might want to wrap it up soon. Do you have any last questions for me or anything you want our audience to know? Final question. I love the title, Love People Use Things. So I wanted to ask you, Noah, what what are some things you do uh, to love people? Well, I can't take credit for coming up with the name. Matt, of course, started the show. Uh, but I do also love that title. It's it's so evocative and you can find a lot of depth and meaning in that title. And what it means to me is pornography and prostitution and sexualization, objectification. It's all about using someone else or their image for your own satisfaction and pleasure. And no matter how conscious you are, 
of that not being your personal reality and of that not being who you really want to be in your relationships with others, it's subconsciously training you to think that way about other people. And I can recognize that happening in my own life over the 15 years that I used porn from when I was you know, 10 to 24 or 9 to 24. And uh, realizing that effect after leaving porn behind was very powerful for me and that allowed me to feel so much more empathy for others and feel others' pain when I saw it and have that ability again and also love others in a way that I had been numbed to and didn't realize was possible for me. Not just romantically, but that as well, but also just valuing valuing the people in my life, my family and my friends and being truly interested and committed to them. So love people use things to me is about getting back to who we, I think, are meant to be, which is social creatures. We evolved in small communities where everyone knew each other, where we were intimately familiar with each other's faults and quirks and strengths and weaknesses. And now that we are in such a larger pool of humanity, it's easy to get desensitized to people. It's like there's more supply for human life than there is demand. And so it's easy, especially when we see on a screen people used in all sorts of ways for sexual satisfaction and pure physical carnal pleasure. It's easy to become calloused to the plight of the humans in our lives and to the feelings and emotions and lived experiences of those people we encounter. And so it's about getting back to that, getting back to that sense of community and connection and love and truly feeling love for people that we don't even know. You know, that type of love that we feel for all of humanity and for all of life, that type of love where we want the best for people we don't even know. Hmm, that's great. I think for me, um, one of the joys of recovery and that was able to be able to receive love and actually let it like hold on to it mm-hmm. uh, for so many years because I was hidden. People couldn't see the real me, so the real me never felt loved. Mm. And so recovery allowed me to feel to receive love and actually contain it. And then from that place of feeling loved, I was actually able to love well, you know, to actually see others um, have empathy grow. And and it's like from being loved, that's where I'm able to actually love well. And I realized when I was in the addiction and when I was not feeling loved, my love was very transactional. You know, it's like I love to get something back. Hmm. Um And now it comes from a deeper place. And I'm not perfect by any means, but it feels a lot better on this side of things. (laughs) You're not perfect, Matt? I I know. (laughs) Newsflash. How dare you coach anybody if you're not perfect? (laughs) (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Well, Matt, where can can people find you? Find your work and find ways to get in touch with you. Well, my uh, my website is recoveredman.com. I got rid of pornfreeradio.com because porn's in the title and it caused all sorts of extra problems for people. Yeah. <laughs> so recoveredman.com is where you can um, get access to me and also uh, get access to the podcast. And, mm-hmm. of course, I'm on all the podcast platforms, iTunes, Google, what is it, Google Connect, Google, Google whatever. Play. Google, yeah. Well, there's Google Play and now there's Google Podcasts, so uh, Stitcher, uh, not on Spotify. Uh, maybe maybe I'll be on Spotify at some point. Uh, but how about you? Where can guys reach? Where can guys meet you? And where can guys uh, uh, um, hear more about what Matt's Matt's doing? Well, you should go to lovepeopleusethings.fm, which is where all of our podcast episodes are stored. And if you're interested in my work, you can go to addictedtointernetporn.com and you can get my my book, Whack Addicted to Internet Porn, there as a PDF for free. Just sign up for my newsletter and also find ways to work with me if you so desire. Awesome, man. All right, Matt. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again for reaching out. I'm sure we'll be working together again in the future in some capacity. Love Maybe it, Co- man. Co- Coach's Corner Part 2 will come someday. Yeah, man. How about Coaches Live? 
and cut.